Okay, we're back from our break, um, the second tape of today. But um, we're skipping ahead. We're, we're the, we had a little bit more on the notes, but I'm just going to skip over those because we're getting to a point where I want to finish up some of the material we've got. And so I'm going to start on the next section, which really is not uh, in the book per se, but uh, you can read other sources and we'll talk a little bit what we've got in the handout here. And what I want to talk about is electrosynthesis. And there is a reference in your notes to a book by Fry, which I've already referred to in the notes previously. But it's a pretty good book talking about various methods in which you can use electrochemistry to generate uh, reagents. Now we talked about in, in uh, already in the bulk electrolysis chapter, we said the goal is not to, uh, um, to understand the reaction a lot of times. The goal is to maximize the product. So we're going to try to maximize the efficiency of the system, try to maximize our chemical system to, to do things up. And of course, what people will do is they'll try to, once they have an electrosynthesis, they might try to understand the mechanism, but their goal is still to not to lose money, to make money and to maximize the output for the amount of work and electricity they put in. Let's just uh, review some of the basic processes that can occur in electrochemical systems and that will give us some idea how to, how to approach the rest of the work. First of all, let's think of some general classes of processes and first of all, we can talk about reductive elimination. And this is a good way to get rid of good leaving groups. So material that would otherwise tend to be susceptible to decomposition but require some kick in the pants to get it to go are susceptible to reductive eliminations. For example, uh, organic halides are very easy to reduce as a rule and when you reduce them they tend to form radical anions which can be stable and um, or unstable depending on the material and usually you'll form radicals and a halide and this can either be a transient or it can be you can think of it as a, as the uh, transition state in some cases. But in some cases it's a transient, in some cases it's a transition state. For organic or aerial halides, often that's a, trans, trans, a transient species that is, can be observed. Sometimes it's a stable species. Uh, but for alkyl halides, often that species is, is not really stable on any, any good thing. Once you have this uh, radical anion, it often will be immediately reduced to the, uh, radi the radical, you can, it would be reduced to the radical or the anion plus uh, usually some uh, base or, or hydrogen source, I should say. So that could be water, you know, B minus would be hydroxide. So X can be halides, all pretty good. Cyanide, thiocyanide. Sometimes you can get um, O or minus, the thiol types, amides. I can't write today. And, uh, and so on. As I said, if the R is the alkyl group, that reaction is often concerted. In other words, it, as soon as you reduce it, the reaction is basically completed, the uh, halide or whatever will be coming off. For aerial halides, often it's considered to be a stepwise reaction. You can, can observe the transient and get a rate constant for that reaction. Now, if the cleavage reaction is slow, you can get secondary reactions. For example, uh, nitrobenzyl bromide, paranitrobenzyl bromide can be reduced in an aproduct solvent such as uh, acetonitrile, tetrahydrofuran, methylene chloride. What you form is uh, often is a, is a dimer as one of the products.
you know, that should be NO2. And so that suggests that the uh, material is, is stable enough to um, undergo a, a coupling chemical reaction. If we have a polyhalide or a poly RX, we often get stepwise stepwise um, elimination of our species. So for example, if we had a species like this, oh, we can often get two steps where one step will be the elimination of one of the X's and the other step would be reduction of the other step. So the first step would be something like RCH2X plus RCH3 and then you would have another uh, another reaction. An example would be 1,4-dibromobutane. Uh, Reduction at minus 1.75 volts versus the SCE. In dimethylformamide and in dimethylformamide gives you a stepwise reaction. And in some cases you get uh, some interesting products such as this uh, square ring, 26 percent. Uh, and most of the time you get though the, the uh, butane out. And of course you get bromide. Now on mercury, what can happen is that you get organomercury mercurial compounds. So a lot of times people are, especially the initial work, a lot of these compounds are using mercury electrodes. And so when you reduce them, what you find is you get these radical species and then that radical species will react with the mercury itself in a chemical reaction. And so you'll get organomercurial compounds out of the, out of the reaction. Another interesting system is this one where you have a lot of bromines associated with the system. You reduce this material, removing two bromides in the process and what happens is that you'll get uh, these spiral compounds and here we've got a, a stepwise for two electron reduction and you put in another, um, whoops those are additional electrons, you put another two electrons in re reducing another two bromides removing another two bromides, you get this spiro pentane. Spiro compound. So you get this bow tie compound. So that's a, it's a root, especially this elimination is a root to some interesting uh, strained compounds because of the way the, the living groups work. That's kind of interesting, but another also the interesting reductions are aromatic compounds. In this case, for example, you can reduce compounds like anthracene. Now if you do this in a solution that has no protons, what you'll get is just a radical anion. So you get a reversible one electron process and uh, nothing else. So you get a nice looking wave, looks really neat. But if you put it in uh, some proton donating solvent, suppose you add some acid or to that non-aqueous solvent or you do it in water, what you can get is 
a system like this where you form a radical, considered to be a radical, where the uh, one proton adds to the overall system, then you get another electron coming in, another proton coming in, and you'll get a conversion to the, um, the ring. Here's a interest of in, and a reaction of interest to um, to our, actually our stuff in our group. Uh, if we do uh, reactions at, of this system at pH is greater than five, suppose we have a nitrophenyl group, a nitrophenyl, a nitrobenzene, I should say. You can actually reduce that with one electron. It turns out when you do that, you make the radical species, or the anion species, which reacts with protons to give us this nitrosobenzene, the pH N dot O O H, which can be um, reduced again to form this uh, this here. Now it turns out that that now is easier to reduce to well this plus hydroxide. This is, turns out to be easier to reduce than the parent compound. So here we have a E C E reaction. But that E that we formed now is easier to reduce than the initial parent. So as soon as we form that, which is a, undergoing a fairly rapid reaction here, uh, we will reduce that immediately at the electrode surface to form this material, which is now weakly alkaline. So it's a little bit basic material. So it will react with protons to form this um, hydroxide species which now can be reduced again to form phenylhydroxylamine. Okay, so here we've got E, C, E, E, C, E. Okay, so it's starting to get a little complicated. So in weakly alkaline solution, we get this basically uh, system. If we increase the alkalinity of the system to a strong base system, we get a different reaction entirely. What happens is now we get a dimerization reaction Minus. And that reacts with the acid or protons and such as there are in solution, and you'll get the azo azoxybenzene. So interesting, um, interesting species. Now, actually, what normally you get. <laughs> is what you, one of the things that we're interested in in our group is that taking that species that we formed uh, here in the weakly alkaline solution can undergo an additional reaction if we have some additional protons available for the reaction.
which is now aniline. Or you can take this species and recover it and heat it in the presence of protons and you'll get paraminophenol. Why is that of interest? Remember we talked actually about this as a way to get, um, we talked about using the diazonium salts of Saviant who said that if you took this species in the diazonium salt form, you could react that on a carbon electrode and form the the paranitrophenol that was attached to the carbon surface. And then I said, what we normally want is there is an amine group on the end, so we did this reduction process, which I think I said is a five electron process to get the, uh, to get the amine. And we had to do that in acetate buffer, which is around pH five. So if we compare our reaction, we'll see that an acetate would get one, two, three, um, four electrons. Oh, and then there's two. So I think it was six, must be six electrons. Six electrons to get to, uh, to get to this point. Maybe it's only five electrons if you, if you don't have an, one of the protons coming on like we do. So I'm, I'm not sure about that. But anyway, that's, uh, that's the point that how we can get our, our aniline out of the system. So we can say that uh, once we get into the realm of organic uh, synthesis, we start to have to get all kinds of uh, crazy compounds and so it gets pretty complicated when people want to get the mechanistic steps of all these systems and try to determine the details. In addition, a lot of these compounds uh, do not have perfect electrochemistry. So even though they can be reduced or oxidized, it's not, you don't see nice looking waves often for these things. And, and uh, for example, in this process here, uh, this overall process gives you just one kind of toad-like wave, you know, and you think, well, okay, so what's that? You know, so all those steps are all in one lump wave and it's hard to analyze. So you have to do lots of interesting experiments to get uh, the exact mechanism out of it. Well, I think we'll stop there because we're out of time and we have a little bit more to talk about and uh, we'll continue that next time. Okay, what we'll do now is I want to talk a little bit about uh, our paper for discussion. All right.